Hello, welcome to the last week of the semester. Uh, we have made it to week 14. The end is right around the corner. In fact, uh, I only have two final topics to talk about, and they're actually related. One is the Cold War in general, and one is the Vietnam War, which is a big part of the Cold War. Uh, also this week, if you haven't uh, seen the calendar, your final exam will open on Thursday the 28th, and you'll have it one week to take that all the way up until Thursday the 5th. And I do recommend you watch this video before you do the final exam. Uh, the last thing, um, all of your final work is still due on Monday night. So um, you get extra time for the final exam, but the regular work is still turned in at the normal time. And that does include the SLO essay. So I, do, I hope you've um, you know looked at the SLO essay video I made for you uh, and if you have any questions about the SLO essay of course you know email me or even if you want me to look at a rough draft I'll do that for you too but let's get into this let's get this video done so I don't waste too much of your time and <clears throat> the Cold War uh, let's talk about this the Third World War begins at the end of World War II um, this is going to be an unfought war it's going to be a war of ideas it's going to be a war of of um, thoughts and this cold war as it becomes known it's going to be the determining factor for international relations for the next 45 to 50 years it's still having residual effects today and the cold war is getting cold again with the fighting between russia and ukraine and nato and everything else now in any war there's at least two sides uh, there's the adversary in the Cold War, there were the adversaries of communism versus the free world or the Western world. And the Western world consisted of the United States, Western Europe, especially England and France, and then other democratic nations. In many ways, this begins right after World War II when the United States is going to fund the rebuilding of Europe. And this rebuilding of Europe is going to be done with what's known as the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is going to help stave off and prevent a second depression. And it's named after George C. Marshall, who is the US Secretary of State. Uh, he came up with this plan to pump in $12 billion worth of economic aid into the war-torn countries of Western Europe. That's a uh, somewhere between 170 and 200 billion dollars today you know in uh, inflation's kind of going up and down right now but what this does is it allows for western europe to rebuild itself after the war is over and it creates this thing known as the european economic community or the common market now one of the goals of the european economic community is gradual economic cooperation among the different countries in Europe. And the EEC is going to work to eliminate trade barriers between countries, strengthen national economies, and eventually the EEC will develop a unified currency, which is what the Euro is today. Now, not all countries joined the EEC, but the ones that did, and the neighbors of the ones who did, they enjoy a lot of economic prosperity rather than economic depression. And on a long enough timeline, this EEC will develop into the European Union we have today. The United Nations is going to be formed after World War II, and it's really being put to the test right now. Uh, the UN, it's the successor to the League of Nations. It has a lot of the same uh, goals as the League of Nations. The UN, it was meant to be a forum where all the different countries of the world could resolve their conflicts peacefully. And for the most part, it's been more successful than not. It hasn't been able to prevent all wars, but it has prevented the biggest ones. While nations from both sides of a conflict are members of the UN, very often, including with Russia and Ukraine, the United Nations itself hasn't been able to stop wars of ideologies 
wars of differing thoughts or differing opinions. So there are some weaknesses to the United Nations, but let's be real, it's better than nothing. Now this Cold War, it's going to be very much a war of alliances. There were four main Western alliances. They do not all exist today, but they were important from about 1945 all the way up until the mid 70s. NATO still exists. That's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That is most of Western Europe, England, Canada, and the United States. CETO was the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and the countries involved with that treaty were like South Vietnam when it existed, Singapore, South Korea, the Philippines, that part of the world. ANZUS, this is Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And then here in the Western Hemisphere, we have, uh, it was originally called the Pan-American Union, but today it's known as the Organization of American States. That's a treaty that covers both North, Central, and South America. Now, in response to all these different alliances, the communist nations led by Russia or the Soviet Union is going to create the Warsaw Pact. So the Warsaw Pact will be the... Soviet Union, officially known as the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. All of Eastern Europe that was, quote, liberated by the Russians. Mongolia is going to take part. Eventually, Cuba will take part in it as well. Now, what was the goal of the Cold War? Well, Western countries and communist countries are interested in what was then known as the third world. Today the third world means something different. Uh, today the third world countries are usually going to be lesser developed, poor countries. But when the Cold War gets started, third world countries were just other. They were countries that had a lot of resources but maybe not a lot of manpower. Uh, they had, they were in strategic locations, but they didn't have the economic development. And so both the East and West will try to prey on these third world countries to gain some sort of advantage against each other. Another very important battlefield is going to be nuclear weapons. The United States, of course, it is the first country to use nuclear weapons. It is also the only country to use nuclear weapons against an enemy. 1945, the two nuclear weapons, known as Little Boy and Fat Man, are dropped on the two Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Very soon after those two nuclear weapons are dropped, the Soviets will employ spies to come and spy on the U.S. nuclear program. And before you know it, by 1960s, there are six countries with nuclear weapons. And those six were the United States, the Soviet Union, France, England, India, and China. Now you might say, why did India develop nuclear weapons? It's because it was seen as the third world and it was trying to protect itself from both the communist and NATO and everything else. Since then, there are a couple other countries that have been added to this nuclear club. Israel has nuclear weapons, Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and North Korea has some nuclear capability. We're just not sure what it is yet. Iran, contrary to what people have said recently, it has not yet developed nuclear weapons. It may do it in the future, but right now it does not have nuclear weapons. And then finally, there is one country that voluntarily gave up its nuclear program. South Africa. They developed nuclear weapons, they tested a nuclear weapon, and then they gave everything up to the United Nations. They decided they did not need it. Now, over time, new 
types of weaponry are going to be developed. Hydrogen bombs are going to be developed, and that's a bomb that within a bomb. Like it takes a nuclear bomb of the hydrogen variety, a separate bomb to launch that bomb. So you have to have a bomb within a bomb to set off the hydrogen bomb. That's how big and powerful it is. Then you have neutron bombs or radiation bombs. And there was even a bomb that was being developed with cobalt. But cobalt bombs, they were dis determined to be too destructive and too dangerous for full-scale testing. So both East and West kind of, they quit developing those. So a lot of the Cold War is based on the idea of more bombs, bigger bombs, better bombs. And all of this is being developed while the world's nations are signing test ban treaties, nuclear free zone treaties, arms limitation treaties, and arms reduction treaties. So the more the amount of weaponry is restricted, the more powerful the weapons got. The arms race could probably be summed up in the basic strategy that both sides employed. And this became known as mutually destruct, assured destruction, or MAD. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, they each felt that the other side would be deterred from launching a nuclear attack if they knew that they would suffer ultimate destruction. So this arms race, this idea of overwhelming power or overwhelming threat becomes the key of the nuclear arms race. If the United States knew that they would be destroyed if they launched a weapon, then the United States will never use a weapon. If the Soviet Union knew they would be destroyed if they launched a weapon, the Soviet Union would never use a weapon. So this idea of mutually assured destruction, the fear that both sides put into the other, kept nuclear weapons from being used. Now, throughout this entire period, the United States maintained about a four to one superiority in destructive capability, but it doesn't really matter when it just takes a couple dozen nuclear weapons to wipe out an entire country. The biggest battlefield is really the United States versus the Soviet Union. And this disagreement, the United States versus Soviet Union, it can actually be traced all the way back to the end of World War II when the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union were meeting on how to handle the end of the war. From July 17th until August 2nd, 1945. So July 17th to August 2nd, 1945, the Potsdam Conference was occurring right outside of Berlin. The Soviet Union and the United States had beaten Germany. Germany has surrendered. And Potsdam, it's going to be the first meeting where Harry Truman is president. So Harry Truman is going to meet with the United, uh, the USSR's foreign minister, Molotov. Truman did not trust the communists. Joseph Stalin did not know anything about Truman. And so there's a whole bunch of trouble going on. In fact, Stalin and Truman don't even meet. Like I said, Truman meets with uh, Molotov instead. They decide that new borders for Germany will be created. They decide that Japanese unconditional surrender will be required. And the Soviet Union says that they want control of Eastern Europe. The United States doesn't agree. And both sides leave the Potsdam Conference angry and distrustful of each other. And that's where the Cold War begins. The Truman Doctrine is going to be issued in 1947. And the idea behind the Truman Doctrine, it said that U.S. must support free peoples around the world who are resisting efforts by outsiders or armed minorities to overthrow their governments. In other words, the Truman Doctrine says that the United States will become the world's police force the United States will help and resist 
any efforts to overthrow governments around the world, the United States will stop communism. This will eventually give rise to the idea of the domino effect. The idea that if the United States let one co country fall to communism, then the next one would fall, the next one would fall, and it would just be like dominoes falling over on top of each other. Now the United States and the Soviet Union will come into direct disagreement in June of 1948. And this is all over who will control Germany and who will control the city of Berlin. In June 1948, Stalin orders a Soviet blockade around the western parts of Berlin. The city of Berlin, just like the country of Germany itself, was divided into different parts. The Soviet Union got a part of Germany, France got a part of Germany, Great Britain got a part of Germany, and the United States got a part of Germany. By 1948, the United States, France, and Great Britain have united their portion of Germany, and it is known or becomes known as West Germany. Berlin was divided by all four parties. The United States, France, and Great Britain had united their part of Berlin. So you end up with an East Berlin and a West Berlin. Well, in June 1948, Stalin is going to order that Soviet blockade around the western part of Berlin, and this is really going to be an effort to force the United States, Britain, and France to abandon the city. The only way that the West could access western Berlin was through the air. Well, over the next 10 months, the United States leads an effort to ship over 2.5 million tons of food, fuel, and supplies into the western part of the city. Everything West Berlin needed to survive was brought in by a constant stream of airplanes. When Joseph Stalin realizes that the blockade will not work, uh, he stops the blockade and he's going to try a different tactic, mainly putting a wall up between East and West Berlin. It's actually the Berlin airlift that is the catalyst, the creator of NATO. And also, by 1950, the Truman government has decided that the United States can no longer rely on others to take the initiative in resisting communism. And NSC 68 is released by the National Security Council. And NSC 68 says, and I quote, the US must take the lead in stopping communism wherever it occurred, regardless of the intrinsic, strategic, or economic value of that area to the United States. To clarify and simplify, wherever communism starts, the United States is going to be there to stop it. The United States tries to stop communism in Cuba. They stop communism in South Korea. They try to stop communism in South Vietnam. Uh, if communism raised its head in your bathtub, the United States was going to be there to bomb your bathtub out of existence. And Cuba is going to be one of the worst problems. Um, by the 1960 election, John F. Kennedy will become president and he's going to switch from this idea of mutually assured destruction to something known as flexible response. Kennedy is going to try and use conventional weapons to stop any communist uprisings, not nuclear weapons. Well, in Cuba, uh, in the 1950s, it's very unsettled because of a dictator named Fulgencio Batista. Uh, Batista was a very unpopular dictator in Cuba, but he was popular around the rest of the world because, well, he wasn't communist. Fidel Castro is going to become a rebel leader within Cuba, and Castro is going to do this world tour trying to get support for a revolution. Um, Castro comes on the Ed Sullivan show here in the United States. He meets with the guy who was vice president in 1960, 1959, 1960, uh, named uh, Richard Nixon. But ultimately, 
uh, Castro is going to talk about nationalizing industry and that sounds like a socialist communist thing so the United States says you know what we're not going to support you and when the United States turns down Castro he then looks at the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union takes Castro under their wing and gives him the supplies he needs well when Castro overthrows Batista in 1959 many Cuban businessmen are going to flee the country because the new Cuban government is going to take their wealth and take their their businesses and when this influx of Cuban businessmen reach the United States that's when Castro becomes really unpopular in the US now in 1959 and 1960 uh, Kennedy's not actually president yet it's still President Eisenhower and President Eisenhower he comes up with this plan to help Cuban refugees regain power basically the CIA in the United States is going to help these Cuban nationals reinvade Cuba and overthrow Castro when Kennedy comes into office he inherits his plan and he's talked into going through with it he's convinced by the CIA he's convinced by Cuban exiles he's even convinced by the mafia to go ahead with his Bay of Pigs invasion and in April 1961 about 1500 anti uh, Castro exiles invade Cuba they land at the Bay of Pigs uh, Castro and his government knew they were coming and they were ready for him it's a complete flop it's a fiasco it's a failure this is going to lead to some you know intense dislike between Cuba and the United States and before you know it in early 1962 uh, a US spy plane is going to fly over the Cuban island and it's going to take photographs that reveal that the Soviets are building a missile base and putting missiles in Cuba and it's very likely that those were their nuclear missiles now Kennedy is going to respond strongly uh, JFK is going to go on TV and condemn this provocative threat on national TV uh, the American government is going to issue an ultimatum saying the missiles have to be removed and the US Navy is going to blockade Cuba basically the United States is going to force Cuba to get rid of the weapons the Soviet premier the guy in charge of the Soviet Union his name was Nikita Khrushchev uh, Khrushchev tries to get the missiles ready for launch US forces are put on the highest alert and even the preparations for invading Cuba are created but then at the last minute uh, Je John F Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev are going to talk to each other and the Soviet Union agrees to remove the missiles from Cuba if the United States will agree not to attack Cuba and remove missiles from Turkey you have to look at the space race as well because that is a big part of the Cold War now the one area of the Cold War that the Soviet Union really gets an early advantage is the space race um, the Soviet Union on October 4th 1957 they're going to launch the Sputnik 1 satellite and Sput Sputnik 1 was about the size of a Volkswagen van and all it did was admit an audible ping that could be picked up on a radio Sputnik 2 will be launched a couple of weeks later in November of 1957 and on Sputnik 2 the first animal in space a dog named Laika will be trained to go into space and um, it's kind of a sad story Laika was a stray dog that was found on the streets of Moscow Laika is trained basically to push a button and receive food and drink and that's how Laika is going to go into space is by pushing this button getting food and drink and the Russians are going to prove that you know flesh and blood can go into outer space unfortunately uh, something happens during the launch and one of the systems that's supposed to keep Leica alive uh, fails 
And Leica probably did not make it to space. She probably overheated before she got there. And once Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 are launched, it is a frightening moment for the United States. Uh, soon to be Vice President and eventual President in his own right, Lyndon B. Johnson, is going to proclaim that he refuses to sleep under the light of a damned communist moon. The United States will launch its own satellite, Explorer 1, in 1958. The U.S. will send their own animals into space, doing it with chimpanzees in 1961. But the first man in space will be put there by the Soviet Union. It's a test pilot named Yuri Gagarin. And Yuri Gagarin will go to space April of 1961. The U.S. does have person number two in space, and that's Alan Shepard. And Alan Shepard goes into space in May of 1961. So the space race is really heating up, and the one place that's, that's left that the United States can get to first is the moon. And John F. Kennedy is going to very famously promise to be the first country to put a man on the moon. He guarantees that the U.S. will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. However, they never say if the decade is 1969 or 1970 because they wanted to have a little bit of wiggle room. When the plan to get to the moon is put into place, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, aka NASA, is created. NASA takes up something like 20% of the entire federal budget and three programs are created from NASA, the Mercury program, the Gemini program, and the Apollo program. All three of those programs are meant to work towards the goal of putting a man on the moon. So the Mercury program is basically going to test out the systems and see if people can go around the, the Earth. The Gemini program will get people in space a little bit longer. And then the Apollo program will start sending people to the moon and back until they do finally land. The first people to, to stand on the moon, Apollo 11, July 20th, 1969. Neil Armstrong is the first man on the moon. Buzz Aldrin films it. He is the second man on the moon. And there is a third man involved. Uh, and he doesn't get any credit, so I always mention his name. Michael Collins is the person who stayed on board Apollo 11 while Buzz and Neil went down to the surface. Now shifting gears, I want to talk about the Vietnam War. And this is really just a little bit of Vietnam history. I'll try to go through it kind of quick and just touch on the highlights of stuff that I think you need to know for the final exam. Uh, first thing I really want you to know though is that the contact between Europe and Vietnam started very early. The first Europeans are going to reach Vietnam in 1498. And the first Europeans to reach Vietnam are going to be French. And over time, Vietnam really just kind of, it becomes a gas station. It's a, it's a waypoint. It becomes known as Indochina because it's halfway between the Chinese ports that Europe could do business and India. Jesuits are going to visit Vietnam. Jesuits are going to convert the locals to Christianity. And St. Loyola himself, the founder of the Jesuits, is going to do uh, some missionary work in 1616. By 1630, there are so many Catholics in Vietnam that the Vietnamese emperor is going to expel all of the Catholic missionaries. Now, fast forward all the way to 1771, and there's going to be a rebellion that happens in Vietnam. Three brothers, who are known as the Taysan Rebellion, uh, they're going to overthrow the emperor of Vietnam. The heir to the throne, his name is Nguyen An, is going to try and get his throne back. And to get his throne back, he's going to ask the French to help him get back into the government. The Taysan brothers, by the way, are going to ask the Chinese for help. 
Um, with the French assistance, Nguyen An is going to regain control of the crown. He's going to become emperor, and he's going to defeat the Taesan brothers. Now, in exchange for this, the French are going to ask for um, future favors. We helped you now, don't forget this, and we're going to come back later. Well, in 1847-1848, um, the French are going to call in the favor. And in 1847-1848, the French are going to begin forcing the, the um, Vietnamese emperors to give up more and more political power. Um, by 1883, Vietnam is completely and totally under French control. There is still technically a French em or a, um, a Vietnamese emperor, but the, the Vietnamese emperor can't leave the palace. They're stuck in the city of Hue, and they cannot leave. Uh, they're basically just a puppet. Almost as soon as the French take over the Vietnamese government, a resistant movement breaks out and this resistance movement lasts about 10 years it's known as loyalty to the king the idea of the loyalty to the king movement was to overthrow the french and return the vietnamese emperor to power um, now the movement's going to be end it's going to end when the emperor is deposed and then put into jail by the french now fast forward again to the year 1916, and there's a, a child emperor. He's a 15-year-old named Dewey Tan. Uh, Dewey Tan is going to sneak out of the Forbidden City and go into the mountains, and he's going to get a lot of people to support him. And a rebellion led by the emperor is going to break out against the French. Now, just like the loyalty to the king movement, this revolt is going to be defeated but it turns out it's the first large-scale rebellion against the french in vietnamese history this is an important guy to know his name is ho chi minh ho chi minh is going to be the leader of the the um, indochina and eventually the vietnamese communist party ho chi minh is in Paris when the Versailles Peace Conference is happening. Ho Chi Minh is in Paris working as a waiter when World War I is ending. And the reason he's there, uh, number one, he speaks French, his dad worked for the French, and uh, number two, he really believes in Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. One of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points was that people could um, have popular determina determinization or that the people of the different countries would be able to vote for their future. And Ho Chi Minh wanted to be there to speak for the Vietnamese saying, hey, why don't you let us vote for our independence and kick the French out? <coughs> In 1926, he writes a book called The Road to Revolution. And he writes this book in modern or in a local Vietnamese culture language whatever you want to call it instead of french language it's because he wanted it to be accessible and readable by the local people there is fighting in in vietnam during world war ii in fact um, japan is going to gain control of vietnam from the french and the Japanese are going to use Vietnam as a food source and a resource um, bucket, if you will. Ho Chi Minh is going to gather a group of resistors against the Japanese. And when the United States finds out that Ho Chi Minh is fighting against the Japanese, uh, the United States agrees to provide Ho Chi Minh troops, weapons, and training for the troops. Now, Ho Chi Minh is going to appoint a guy named Vo Nguyen Giap to be his top general. And this is a, a pretty top guy. He had fought in the Chinese Civil War. He was professionally trained in how to do underground guerrilla warfare. And um, he was very capable. And he knew history, too, because his 
prior job was a, a history professor. By 1945, Japan knows that they're going to lose, so they try to set up an independent Vietnam, and they give power to the Vietnamese emperor, a guy named Bao Dai. On August 28th, the Japanese are going to surrender to Bao Dai and Ho Chi Minh, and Ho Chi Minh is going to declare an independent Democratic Republic of Vietnam on September 2nd of 1945. The problem is, though, nobody in the West is going to listen to this. Now, from a few minutes ago, uh, you saw the, sc the screen or the slide, whatever you, you want to call it, about the Marshall Plan. Well, some of the Marshall Plan money that was given to France was used to reconquer and retake French colonies. So in February of 1945, the, the French are going to try and reassert their dominance over their colonies in Southeast Asia. This colony as a whole was called Indochina. Vietnam was part of Indochina. Um, I mean, the French decide they want Vietnam back. The Japanese forces who have just surrendered are given their guns back and told to keep control of the territory until the French can get there. Um, a new colonial government is set up at the exact same time Ho Chi Minh is creating his government and fighting breaks out between Ho Chi Minh and his group and then the French colonialists. Now Ho Chi Minh's plan to, re to unite Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh's plan to get rid of the French, he wants to win support of the people, he wants to get supplies from his allies, and he wants to start rebellions. And then finally he wants to fight the French in a decisive battle. In the fall of 1953, Ho Chi Minh helps start a rebellion in the territory of Laos and while the French army is busy putting out that rebellion Vo Nguyen Giap is going to attack a military base known as Dien Bien Phu. Now if you've never heard of Dien Bien Phu before it was a military base down in a valley surrounded by mountains the only way in and out was like miles and miles and miles through a jungle on a dirt road or from the air. Well, when Vo Nguyen Giap begins the fight on Dien Bien Phu, the first thing he does is takes out the airstrip, the landing strip, which prevents the French from bringing in reinforcements. And by the time this is all done, it's a horribly embarrassing defeat for the French and it's um, going to be the start of the end of French control in Indochina. Now both the French and the Vietnamese government are going to agree to hold elections in 1956. These elections would be to decide whether Vietnam would be um, either a westernized country or a communist country. And the elections never happened because the, the pro-French uh, keep putting it off and off and off. And eventually the pro-French are going to call for a separate independent country in the South. This becomes the country of South Vietnam. And a guy named Go Dinh Diem will become the president of South Vietnam. Now Go Dinh Diem, he's not a good guy. He's just not communist, so he's supported. The United States is going to start supporting South Vietnam with direct military aid and direct economic aid. And this is seen as propping up one of those dominoes when it comes to uh, domino theory. When the 1956 elections don't begin, the Communist Party reactivates all of their guerrilla soldiers. The guerrilla soldiers known as the Viet Cong begin launching attacks throughout South Vietnam to try and force these elections to happen. Well, as part of, this, of the Cold War and part of trying to keep these dominoes from falling, in 1961, John F. Kennedy is going to publicly announce plans to support Vietnam and help it maintain its independence. So more and more military aid, more and more economic aid is going to be set into South Vietnam. 
by the end of 1961, the first U.S. troops are in South Vietnam. They're there to observe and help train the South Vietnamese Army. And then by the end of 1962, we went from one soldier to about 11,000 soldiers. Still no combat troops. These are supposed to be 11,000 people observing any fighting and teaching the South Vietnamese what to do. Now the South Vietnamese army was not very good. They just continually lost battle after battle after battle to the Viet Cong guerrillas. And before you know it, there's actually an anti-government demonstration that happens in South Vietnam. Go Dinh Diem, who was a Catholic, blames this uprising on Buddhists. He starts uprooting and rounding up Buddhist people. And he tortures them, calls them communists, and some Buddhist monks are going to burn themselves to death in protest of this. Um, things get so bad in Vietnam that by November of 1963, the United States is going to orchestrate and help carry out a coup, an overthrow of the DM government. Now this starts a long series of events um, between November of 1963 and July of 1965 South Vietnam has 10 different governments and it is very very unstable. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is a made up incident that was used by President Lyndon B. Johnson to justify getting deeper into Vietnam and trying even harder to, pre to prevent the um, domino of South Vietnam from falling. August 7th of 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution is passed and that gave LBJ permission to use any force he wanted in Vietnam. As a result of this Gulf of Tonkin resolution on August 7th, fast forward to February and Operation Rolling Thunder is happening. Operation Rolling Thunder is a continuous bombing campaign hitting both North and South Vietnam, hitting Laos, hitting Cambodia, and by far the most bombs are dropped on South Vietnam. This is when the first combat troops arrive. The first soldier meant to actually do fighting arrives in on August 8, 1965. A little less than 4,000 U.S. Marines are going to do a World War II style landing. They're going to storm the beach of Da Nang and when they get off the boats ready to shoot people they're welcomed by locals who say welcome to Vietnam. Uh, by the end of December 1965 there's over 200,000 U.S. troops. By 1968 there's over half a million U.S. troops and also South Korea is contributing another 200,000 troops on top of this. Now a big part of the Vietnam War is centered around the Tet Offensive. Um, the Tet Offensive was going to be a big decisive victory against the Americans except it failed. Um, by 1968, the United States was telling its people that the war was being won, that the war would end any day, and the Tet Offensive, it's going to be an attack by North Vietnam on South Vietnamese cities. Uh, it's coordinated. So, the Vietnamese government, led by Vo Nguyen Giap, the general, is going to organize a coordinated attack on multiple South Vietnamese cities. In fact, over a hundred cities, 
towns and villages will be attacked at the same time. And this is at a moment where the U.S. government is telling the U.S. people that the war is almost over. Now, ultimately, the South Vietnamese and the Americans repel this attack, but it has a huge dent in the American psyche. Uh, the Americans who have been telling or the American people who've been being told, hey, the war's almost over, the war's almost over, they learn it's not, and it's a psychological defeat for America. In fact, as a result of the Tet Offensive, the United States is going to be forced to begin drawing down and pulling back from Vietnam. Uh, when Richard Nixon is elected president in 1969, he is running on a platform of ending the Vietnam War. And by August of 1969, he actually starts to pull U.S. troops out of Vietnam. The problem, though, is even while Richard Nixon is pulling troops out of Vietnam, he invades another country. He invades Cambodia, which was not even involved in the fight to begin with. When the United States public finds out about the invasion of Cambodia, they accuse Nixon of lying and the anti-war movement grows even bigger then. War protests are going to break out in the United States. Communist countries are going to use these war protests as uh, propaganda to show that the United States is not all it's cracked up to be. And these war protests are very big. Like April of 1967, there's over half a million people protesting in New York City. October of 1967, there are almost half a million people protesting in Washington, D.C. And even soldiers coming back from the war start to actively protest the war and actively encourage people not to go when they're drafted. Now, in the end, by 1972, Richard Nixon begins to secretly negotiate with the North Vietnamese government. Not even the South Vietnamese knew this was happening. Um, a ceasefire is agreed to at the end of January 1973, and the ceasefire agreement basically said the United States will leave the country by the end of March. By the end of March 1973, all U.S. troops are gone. An unsteady peace is left over. But by 1974, the North and South are already fighting each other again. And despite promises from the United States that they would come back and help South Vietnam if the fighting started again, um, the United States does not do that because it was, well, not politically possible. So by the beginning of 1975, the South Vietnamese government has lost control of most of its territory. And by April 30th, 1975, the capital city, Saigon, falls to the communist forces and it's renamed Ho Chi Minh City. And if you're curious about that picture right there, uh, this is from the last days of the American presence in Vietnam. That's um, a helicopter on the roof of the U.S. Embassy, and at the last moment, the United States tried to rescue as many Vietnamese civilians who had helped the American government and get them out of the country because there were real fears that they were going to turn up, you know, dead or or um, be put in prison. But um, the Vietnam War, it's going to be probably the biggest flashpoint of the entire Cold War, which is why I make that a separate lecture there. And um, you know, I tried to keep it as short as possible, but the Vietnam War, it's absolutely a fascinating 15 years or so. Okay, so that's it for this. These You've uh, gotten all the lecture material for the semester. I will try to put out some sort of study guide for you. Um, but the easiest way to study is to go back and watch these videos and go back and um, look at these PowerPoints. So make sure you do spend some time doing that before you try to do the final exam. 
It has been a pleasure. Um, I've gotten to know some of you. I appreciate that. Hopefully I'll see some of your faces in a classroom next semester or maybe in the fall. But in any case, I have enjoyed it and I wish you good luck on your final exam. We'll talk to you again. Bye-bye.